Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's event entire, entitled Equality, Influence, and the Next Generation of Sports Media. Today's event is presented by the Seton Hall Center for Sports Media. My name is BJ Schechter. I'm a professional residence in the College of Communication and the Arts, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's discussion. First, a few thank yous. Thanks particularly to Provost Dr. Passerini, Interim Dean Martinelli, Vice Dean Renee Robinson, the university's executive cabinet, invited guests, alumni, and founder Bob Lee, and to our partners at RWJ Barnabas Health for sponsoring this event. We'd also like to thank the Yogi Berra Museum, which has an exhibit featuring some of Billie Jean's photos throughout the years. And a most special welcome to all of our students, because today you'll enjoy an exceptional opportunity to hear from, to learn from, and to interact with one of the seminal figures in the social history of sports in the United States. This latest major event hosted by the Center for Sports Media um, is a very special one. Earlier this month, we, uh, the Center co-hosted um, with ESPNW, a campus conversation. Late last semester, the Center staged a panel discussion about the examination of the plight of Brittany Griner just hours prior to her release from Russia. At our major gala last September, we honored journalist Robin Roberts with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And last spring, the center staged a very memorable full day visit from Alex Rodriguez, which also included breakout sessions with many of our students. So today's event is very much in that tradition as we again bring together members of the university community across all colleges, schools, disciplines, and to seek a further ex understanding of the vital stories and issues involving sports and how to convey them. At the helm of our ongoing effort is our executive director who is approaching her first anniversary in her position. If you have not yet met Jane McNannis in person, I urge you to do so. Her door is always open. This semester, she's also teaching a subject at which she is a master, sports reporting. Her vision and leadership have given the center a remarkable first year of achievement and energy. Please welcome today's moderator and our executive director, Jane McManus. With us today, we have two guests. Our first guest is a woman who forged a career as an athlete. At one point, she earned the number one doubles ranking in the tennis world, and she was also ranked in the top 20 in the world as a singles player. For 22 years, she was commissioner of the world uh, tennis, team tennis, and she is currently CEO of Billie Jean Enterprises. Along with Billie Jean, Alana is also a member of the ownership team of the Dodgers, Sparks, and Angel FC. Please welcome Alana Koss. When we start to compile the short list of remarkable sports figures throughout history who have bent the arc, our next guest is featured very prominently. On the court, she is a 39-time Grand Slam champion in singles and doubles. Think about that for a second, 39 times. But as good as she was on the court, her lifelong work in, in activism in work for opportunity and equality for all people in sports elevates her to a rare place in history. Life Magazine cited her as one of the top 10, uh, top 100 most important Americans of the 20th century. She's the recipient of the French Legion of Honor the f and the first female athlete to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The, a the USTA National Tennis Center in Queens bears her name, as it should. Ladies and gentlemen, please extend a warm welcome to Billie Jean King.
That's quite an entrance, Billy. <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. I believe you get the, the center, the center oh seat boy. here. Where's my uh, crown? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's coming up at the end of the presentation. Oh, oh okay. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's important to start off by saying is that we judge progress often not in years but in generations. Um, and one thing that we have right now that's going to show exactly that kind of progress is a video that we're, <laughs> that we're going to run right now. We're going to cue the live stream on this for four minutes while we show you this video. gives you a sense of Billie Jean King's history.
<laughs> Did you hear Snoop Dogg's voice? Because <laughs> we're both from Long Beach, California. Yeah, he went Long Beach. <laughs> um, so if you liked that footage, I should let you know that the Yogi Bear Museum has an exhibit with some of the early photos of your career. And if you want to spend a little bit of time after this appreciating that, certainly you could very close by in Montclair. Um, so I want to take you through a few numbers uh, because, you know, again, with this idea of progress, in your lifetime, uh, you know, <laughs> your career. I know where you're going. <laughs> I know, I, I did convey that a little bit. Your career earnings, uh, $1.9 million. Mm -hmm. um, you were entered into the Hall of Fame in 1987. So for some context, uh, there was a, a young woman born in 1981 named Serena Williams who just retired and her lifetime earnings were $94 million on the court. That's not, not off, off the court, it's made a lot more money. That's right. on the court, it's like nothing. I know, but why, does, why do you think that is then? Oh, I know why. <laughs> <laughs> Original nine. That's right, that's right. So, you know, tennis is without argument, I think the most lucrative sport for professional players. Oh, by far. And we're the leaders for sure. You had a 50 year head start in some ways, or at least a 30-year head start. No, uh, 50, that's yeah. correct. Um, and, but things are changing. I think 50 years after Title IX now, um, you have an, a National Women's Soccer League franchise. Three of them are gonna go for $50 million now. Three are? Mm -hmm. I thought one was. Well, I think they're putting them on the, on the market oh, for that. Oh, I see. Um, you have I ESPN see. and NCAA signing a deal worth $500 million to broadcast 14 women's events and the US uh, women's and men's national teams in soccer just negotiated new CBAs which gave the men and the women equal pay for the first time in history. Um. So when you see this movement in enthusiasm, is this, is this the moment? Is what? The, no, we're not even starting. I mean, this is like just getting started. We're always uh, so far behind so far behind um, and I just think companies should ask themselves do you spend as much on women's sports as you do on men's sports that's the one I want to see yeah I think also what you said Billy is um, if you give if you invest in women you give them the same kind of emotional investment financial investment and time commitment then judge and I think people tend to look at men's sports and how long they've been around and they don't really give women's sports the same opportunities. And I think that's starting to change. I think you're starting to get, um, I call them the B guys, uh, mostly, and women, the billionaires involved in <laughs> owning um, women's sports teams and franchises to round out their portfolio. And I think that's really significant. So. I think there's, um, people are starting to see a huge upside in, yeah. in investing in, in women and in women's sports. Yeah, they, they have a lot more B guys now, B people, billion, billion, billionaires. In the old days, is oh, they have a lot of millions. So <laughs> that's changed right there. So am I giving you a lot of feedback? Yeah, yeah. a little bit, a little bit. Working. We can fix that. Well, I, you I know, so I can fix it or not. I can start to project. <laughs> I, can, I can play my coat. <laughs> I put on my, my coach's hat where I, you have to project. <laughs> Um, well, you have Mark. You have Mark Davis, right, with the with the Aces. Yeah, that's tr and, um, and Cy. We, were, we went there and met him and had a, a Title Nine uh, night there, and I got to know him a lot better. And he just feels so strongly about the women deserve as much as the guys, but we also have to earn it. Um, if you look at money, it's been really rough go because uh, what, ha what? Okay, here's what always used to happen. Like the NCAA would do the basketball contract for the men and just throw the women in for nothing. And that's how it started. And what happened, that set the culture of, oh, they're free, let's just worry about the guys. Instead of just worrying about everyone. Uh, just so you know, I grew up with this younger brother, almost five years younger, who played 12 years of professional baseball, um, mostly with the San Francisco Giants as a relief pitcher. So he and I grew up and uh, together, obviously, and he always says to me, he cannot believe how much harder it is for girls than for boys. And of course, he had two girls. He, he and his wife had two girls. 
but now he's got four grandsons. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. He says, we've got to have one granddaughter. I said, don't worry about that, just as long as they're healthy. And he's like, I know, but I'm so used to grandsons. Anyway, so, <laughs> but, so anyway, he, he says, all I have to do is get on the bus at 5.30, and I'm taken care of. I leave my clothes. I don't have to do it in my clothes. I don't do anything. I don't do travel. I don't, all of us had to do all of that. I mean, we used to wash our clothes in the bathtub at the French with that red clay. Yuck. <laughs> oh, it's just shocking. But no, but uh, I think the most important thing I can tell you today is how a lot of this got started for tennis, but also it spilled over onto other women's sports to make them and allow them to think differently. That's where how we've led. These soccer players, I mean, I've been talking to them since the 90s about you got to change, you got to change. And I, I can tell a Julie Salley story in a minute, but... The, the thing I can tell you, in 1970, which is um, 53 now, years ago, there were nine of us. Uh, oh, let me just, okay, there was pro tennis in 1968. It was amateur before, which I hated. And I wanted to change tennis to be pro. Pro means you're really good. Amateur means it's a hobby. And yet all the best players were playing in these, am at least for the women, amateur. So I thought that's, one, that's number one. Get tennis to be pro so we're People think of us as the best. Okay, we got that in 68, getting very excited. Rod Laver got a check for 2,000 pounds at Wimbledon. I got one for 750 pounds. And right there I said, uh-oh, we're going to have problems. My former husband said the men will try to get rid of us. I said, no, they won't. They're my friends. He said, you watch. Sure enough, Larry was right. I was wrong, totally wrong. And they started to try to get rid of tournaments, give us less money. And finally, there were nine of us that, that we'd set up. We got Gladys Hellman, who's the publisher of World Tennis Magazine, to sign us for $1 bill. There's, an, one, there's a great iconic photo of us. And that is the birth of women's professional tennis. That, if you see that photo, you can go, that's the birth of women's professional tennis. So this was 1970. We played a, a, an eight-woman tournament at the Houston Racquet Club. Flash forward to 1971, we had our first tour, the Virginia Slims of San Francisco, Oakland, Long Beach. Anyway, that's how we got started. Um, so uh, we got suspended. Uh, the two Australians got suspended first, Judy Dalton and um, Carrie Melville-Reed. Uh, they said, don't come home. You're not going to ever get to play here again. Um, so we just celebrated in Australia a couple of weeks ago. It's pretty nice uh, that we made it. So those are the things uh, that we did, and then um, I mean, that's, that's where we got started. So every, that is really important to understand. That tees up everything. And then the other women's sports started to see us do this. I mean, we didn't have a Women's World Cup until 1991, okay, for soccer. So th these are the, so you see how, but they'd always talk to us, like Julie Foudy in the 90s. Uh, I met her at the Women's Sports Foundation dinner, and she said, I got to talk to you. And she started calling me Kinger. <laughs> hey, Kinger. You know, she is hilarious. I hope you listen to her podcast. What is it, Laughter? Or Laughter whatever? Permitted with oh Julie Foudy. Very she good is podcast. Hilarious. She was the captain of the team, along with the, was it Lily? Yeah, uh, Mia Hamm was on that team no, as well. No, she wasn't the Lily, but yeah. But Mia Hamm was the superstar. But the heart and soul of the team was really Julie, Julie because she would always give them the pep talks and, you know, and the whatever. She but, would do the worm on the dance floor. Right. She would do her, I mean, she, she was hilarious and really smart. She could have gone to medical school, decided not to. She loved the soccer so much and works for ESPN now. But she said to me in the 90s when we met, she's like, I got to talk to you, I got to talk to you. She said, we've got we've to improve, we've got to go forward. And I, I don't know what to do because, uh, you know, I don't know. And I said, okay, let's have breakfast. We had breakfast four years in a row in the morning and, so I remember saying to her, well, what do you have that we would have leverage? Let's go through it. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, where would they be upset? The association, what's the, where is it called? U.S. Soccer Federation. U.S. Federation. Soccer, right. She goes, well, I said, well, how about World Championships, Olympics? I can get you started. She goes, oh, yeah, we probably have four or five things. I said, well, that's what you have to use. But the most important thing you have to do is get the next generation, not just do. Because they think you're old. If you go to them, they're going to go, okay, we'll go to the next generation. Guess what happened? When they finally did have the guts to leverage, which they didn't. Every, these, these events kept passing. I go, Julie, did you do anything? No. Well, when are you going to get her? You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And so finally, at the Olympics, we're not going to play. 
And they said, that's fine. We'll get the next generation. Julie goes, no, 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 no. They're with us. And we went, oops. <laughs> I don't know. That's what started it. They teed that up for the soccer women now. And if you go back through history, in the 91, Sherry Acker, was it Acker? Akers? Michelle. Michelle. Michelle Acker. Sherry played tennis, sorry. <laughs> uh, Michelle uh, kicked two, the two um, go, you know, goals for us to win, and she's probably our first superstar, and I guarantee you none of us, see, I didn't even get her name right. I didn't remember. Well, but this is a generation that, you know, they haven't personally experienced many of those things that, you know, the prior women who played had to go through in order to reach these there's, heights. There's one saying, then I'm going to shut up and let Lana take over and you guys, but <laughs> the more you know about history, the more you know about yourself, but most importantly, it helps you shape the future. I love history. I've been trying to read all the history on Seton Hall ladies. And <laughs> I realize you don't have the men's team, right? We figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's the roster for the tennis, men, men's tennis team? Well, doesn't come up, doesn't come up. We do have some members of the women's tennis team, though. Great. That we're very excited about. Right awesome. over there, I see Ina. Yeah. We'll get to you later, but <laughs> anyway, I think if I always read everything I could on history, and that really helped me figure things out, and to own tournaments, so I knew the business side. Athletes never, ever, usually never understand the other side. All they want is more. Like, I love the WNBA. We want to have chartered flights, too. Sure, how's your budget doing compared to the guys? I mean, but they'll say, well, it hasn't been fair. You're correct, it's not fair. But you've got to at least understand the other side, understand sponsors. Sponsors and partnerships are vital. If you don't have that, you will not make it. It's real simple. Probably so anyway, a good time to thank up. our sponsor and partner yes, exactly. here today, RWJ Barnabas Health. Thank you all for Great. coming. Thank you. Just appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank and you. Ilana, as to the partnerships in particular, because I know, you know, Billie Jean King Enterprises and as CEO, you do a lot with that. What are those conversations like when you walk into a boardroom and, and you're looking to shape the way that different companies are looking at, at those sponsorships? Well, I think things have changed a lot. And I think now um, we always ask CEOs, are you investing the same amount of dollars in women's sports as you are in men's sports. And I think um, what you realize is that CEOs overnight can change it and they can make those decisions. And so I think that is um, hugely important. I think Billy talked about a lot of times women's sports are an add-on, um, but I do think CEOs are looking at that differently. Uh, for example, in the Billie Jean King Cup, uh, our previous sponsor, we were, the Billie Jean King Cup was an add-on to the Davis Cup, which was the men's equivalent. Um, and we went out and we found a company, Gamebridge, um, and they are committed to investing in women's sports and trying to even out their portfolio. It's good business. It's great for your shareholders. It's great for um, your employees. So I think we're finding that when you go to companies, ask, ask them, because a lot of times they really haven't thought about it. Um, yeah. And I think what we do always, we try to find out, um, does the CEO or is there someone you're talking to on the leadership team have daughters? Because I think if you do have daughters, it's pretty easy to make the argument, wouldn't you want the same investment supporting young girls and women as you would the men? So speaking of supporting um, su supporting women and women's sports, we did see during the Super Bowl, I think I caught a glimpse uh, of you in one of the advertisements. No, but it's Deanna we'll talk about after, so okay. you tell me. We have, no, so. we have the ad. I it's think we're going to show it. If we, could, if we could go ahead and show that here, we'd pause the stream on that again uh, for just a few minutes, well, 60 seconds probably, while the ad runs.
I got a chance to talk to Yana um, and was asking her questions and you know they won Mexico beat the US in flag football if you look it up which I hadn't I looked it up before I went to this commercial because I said I don't really understand I mean I love flag football I used to play it I used to go watch the fraternities sororities play it but it's all over the world so anyway I was talking to her and we went through it and she's telling me about it that Mexico beat us and you know how excited she was and I said okay most importantly did you get any money for winning <laughs> <laughs> and she goes no I said okay let's talk so we're talking because it's ridiculous yeah I mean it's I mean it's what a great jock huh I mean yeah she's so agile and she took ballet she took everything she's like whatever make her better but she's not that big which makes her it helps her you know lower her center of gravity all that but she's quick smart too she's smart so it's going to be a great adventure to spend some time with her and see uh, I asked the NFL I gave them I mean I've given them this idea I don't speaking know speaking of money and I yeah. said well mm -hmm. why don't you buy uh, flag football and own it and really help because you've been trying to figure out ways to have more women involved and have some exposure and I said this would be great you get on the league it'd be cheap there's no they're not making any money yet and I, so I keep pounding a little on that I hope they will and guys play flag football too I said hello I used to go watch co-ed flag football all the time but it's really big and there's no concussions involved which I like for the health situation so anyway I don't know I hope something comes from it she's a leader though she's gonna be a pioneer you'll see she's about 24 or 5 she's telling me I'm 24 but anyway, I was very excited for her. Yeah, well, it's, you and know. I had fun. I mean, I had a blast. <laughs> I'm sure. My, my new nickname's Oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have two, uh, two more football leagues that'll be playing in the spring this That's year. Right, USFL. Uh, USFL and, um, and then I think re Arena might be on the way. But so the idea then that you have this, you know, multitudes of, of football leagues coming in um, where a flag football team. Be co-ed. Right. But I want to add on men and women being together. I, everyone thinks I'm always for women, but I'm not really. I'm for all of us. And I like it when we play together, actually. Well, you started, you both, and Alana, you're the CEO of World Team Tennis, which is you have an equal number of men and women who can equal. compete and they equally contribute to the final score. And obviously, that's a, that's, you know, that, how long has that been, league been? Uh, it's, we uh, sold it. We sold it about six years ago. Uh. Um, after running it for over 40 years. So um, I think we learned, you know, you always are learning how to do better and what to do differently. But it, it was a, um, an incredible product because no matter who you were when you came to a World Team Tennis match, you could see yourself. And it was really, um, for tennis, tennis tends to be very individual but we really believe that um, there's a huge element where you can have team in, in tennis. And um, we thought it was great to be able to represent your city and play for somebody a little more than yourself. Um, but, you know, I think certainly in tennis and in a lot of sports, um, when you're selling the media rights and sponsorship, um, the the events that have men and women, like the US Open, Indian Wells, Miami, uh, the other three majors, um, definitely are more valuable. And, are, uh, you know, selling the rights together are um, so much, it's just so much more profitable. So I think having men and women together um, is, is fantastic. I, I do think in some cases, um, obviously we were, we worked very hard to try to get World Team Tennis to be part of the NCAA school system in tennis because we thought um, it would allow you know both men's and women's teams to come together and have a co-ed team. Uh, it is challenging though because um, when you do have a, a co-ed team, maybe there are less opportunities for coaches or, or team members. So, um, but I do think the product where you have men and women together is great. It's great for the fans, it's great for the competitors, and a uh, much more entertaining product. Well, the ITA, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, I can't get them to move, but I've always felt um, there should be a co-ed element because we could be, and tennis to me, to make it big in college, is you have to be revenue producing. 
And team is much better way to get revenue and to have equality on the court and off the court. Um, so I, I've always been fighting this for years and haven't got any place, but uh, we, uh, maybe some younger ones here will hear this story <laughs> and you can change it. But I think there should be a season where they're together. I'm not saying get rid of your spring, keep your spring, whatever. The point is, I want you to be reve revenue producing because when you're revenue producing, people listen. Presidents of universities, coaches, everybody wins, okay? Administrators, ADs, uh, and I can't get, tennis people do not like to budge, but tennis, what makes it great is where, everybody says, oh, it's individual. No, it's a team sport and individual. How many sports can say that? I think there are, I mean, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer. It, it's, tennis is certainly one of those sports, but there are other ways that you could combine events. We, um, we have a poll here at Seton Hall that's run through the Stillman School, and they have done some polling on, on sports, right. and particularly women's sports, and find that 57% of avid fans mm -hmm. would like to see more combined events where men and women play with or against each other. I think, you know, the World Cup is a place where you might be able to combine in the way that a Grand Slam combines. And yeah. as you all noted, those events are far more lucrative that where their combined events are far more lucrative for the organizers no brainer. than single gender. And, and of course, the NCAA tournament is another place where you might be able to see different sports coming yeah. together in the same place to compete. From your lips to, God, from your lips to God's <laughs> ears. No, this, is, this has been my, own, my whole life. Well, and so why then? Nobody will budge. Why do you think, why do you think that is then, when it would bring more money? People get used to whatever is. They just love it. They understand it. They're losing, but they understand it. It feels comfortable. It's like, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay, I had, a, I had a, a, somebody text me in the business, and she said, I'm so uncomfortable, I don't know what to do. And I finally said, you're just going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it's possible. And especially if you've been an athlete of any kind. I don't mean a great athlete. I mean just you love sports. It helps you in everyday life. I mean, they've proven time and time again that it enhances your life. For girls, you learn to trust your body. We're told not to. Boys are always taught, well, the, well I'm now I'm talking about socialization, which I think is so important. You know, with the boys being taught to be brave and, and girls taught to be perfect. It's not possible. Boys should not be brave all the time. And girls are never going to be perfect. Boys are not perfect. And girls constantly have no self-confidence because of that factor. But we have been socialized to have, it's just, uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into it, but you see it. <laughs> I'm, and you know, I'm, I don't care anymore. I'm at the age, I don't care. Is Pam Tower here today? Is Pam Tower here? Hi, Pam. Pam. Uh, Dan's there too. Hi. <laughs> anyway, the last time I was here at Seton, Paul, Seton Hall was when, for their wedding. Oh wow! Okay. The chapel. What year oh, was that? Oh, how cool is that? 1984. 1984. Anyway, I was. I'm so happy. We're here for Jane. But <laughs> when I, but Pam used to be when I played World Team Tennis for New York, um, at the Felt Forum in the Garden, and if we played at the gar when we played in the real, real Garden for 17, 18,000 people. She was in high school, I think it was senior, or a junior, or both, maybe junior and senior year. Oh, you're even less, oh gosh, okay. What did you call yourself? I, I was player assistant. Player assistant? What she would do, we'd change ins, and she'd make sure there's water, towels, whatever we needed. <laughs> and that's how we met, it was great when I went to their wedding in 84, and now they have, what, three girls, grandkids, I mean, it's so cute. <laughs> that's great. That is so great. Anyway, that's the last time I was here. Oh, it was wow. a beautiful wedding. It was unreal. Well, people rave about the, the chapel. It's, it's a chapel. Uh, it, is, beautiful. it is tough to book, but if you can get in there, memories for a lifetime, I think, right? No, it's, it's beautiful. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience in a few minutes, so if you'd like to, you can queue at the microphones. Um, but first, I wanted to ask Alana uh, something that I think probably is something that a lot of, of students on this campus are interested in, and that's the new rules around name, uh -oh. image, and likeness. And, it, you know, these are, uh, you know, these, these, these are either loved or detested, depending on where you sit in the college sports world. Um, but I think it does present, speaking of revenue, an opportunity for 
players in women's sports to earn while, you know, based off their name, image, likeness. How do you see that changing things? I mean, I think um, it's fantastic that I think the athletes are going to be rewarded financially. Uh, I think Billy and I have always felt that college sports, uh, certainly football, basketball, the big ones, are uh, revenue, significant revenue producing. Coaches get millions of dollars in salaries um, at the big schools, obviously not everywhere. And um, that, you know, why shouldn't the athletes be able to at least live decently and, you know, uh, be able to earn some money. Um, you know, having said that, uh, it, it is complicated. You have, I think all of you know, know this as well as I do, uh, you know, you have sponsors and brands, you have uh, boosters, um, Boosters. people who are giving money, and then, you know, obviously you have, you know, uh, you're, you're raising funds, right, through, through other vehicles. So I think in general, I think it's a good thing. It feels a little bit like the Wild West right now. Um, it is concerning um, that I think a significant amount of the money is obviously going to basketball and football. Uh, and, you know, they say, well, if you pull basketball and football out, then, you know, women are getting 52% of the money. Well, <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> hello. Right. Hello. Right. hello. hello. So, so I think, um, you know, there are some women who are doing better, which is great. But um, I do think uh, the bigger it gets, the more schools that get involved. I, you know, there are also concerns uh, as a way to get around Title IX. So also, what about uh, recruiting? I, I, I have, yeah, um, and I, you know, I think obviously um, boosters are are using it to to bring uh, talent to their schools. So I think it's going to hurt the smaller schools. I also have concerns that maybe. Funds won't go into upgrading facilities and, um, and uniforms and things that are important for, for some of the other sports. So, you know, I think it's, I believe it's more good than not. Um, I think Seton Hall has a, a program, I looked it up, which is a cute name, uh, Hall Hands on Deck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, That's great. You know, all volunteers that have, I think, goals to raise 100,000, you've raised 20, come on, guys, get going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think overall it's good, but uh, I think it's a little bit of the Wild West now, so um, what's it there for? needs to be, what's, I don't know, to help athletes. Oh, the 100,000 yeah, to help yeah, athletes? Yeah. They've only when you say help athletes, what does that mean? Um, I know? think... Uh, well, they get, do you tell one of you can tell us? Uh, just support, just, uh, you know, uh, okay. equipment, support, it could be uniforms, anything, yeah. food. Um, but I, I do think overall it's a good thing. Yeah. The question is, um, you know, how, how do you uh, put some guardrails on it? Because there aren't any guardrails right now. Yeah. All right. We have someone over here. Yeah. Would you like to oh. check the mic? See questions from the audience here? Very good. Yeah. Go for it. Is it working? Okay. <laughs> the which one? On the swim, swim team. Swim, 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 that's what I thought you'd say. And uh, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, where do you think that our generation of collegiate athletes are excelling and then where are we maybe falling short that we could step up a little more? Okay. I don't think I know. I'm not in your world enough to know, but what do you think? I, I would say... Um, oh, <laughs> no. Sorry, Lon. Sorry, Lon. Lana, don't. Me, 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 me. Um, um, so, you know, I think uh, it's really important to understand the business. Uh, if you want to get into sports business or, or anything, understand the business. Don't only worry about your training and, and actually doing your sport. Um, I mean, we've heard companies say all the time they, they love to hire athletes. Athletes are disciplined. They know how to pick themselves up. If they don't win, they come up with solutions. They get in the solution. I think that's a big plus. Uh, 
sometimes it can be challenging because uh, if you're a college athlete in the summer, you're off competing and doing other things when some of the other kids are actually doing practical internships. But I think the most important thing is to, in, in any field that you're, you're gonna wanna go into is really understand the business you know, from 360 perspective because um, you want to be able to solve problems and not only look at, you know, the area that you're in. What do you want? What you? What are you majoring in? Uh, double major in finance and IT management. Great job. Great job. Well, one thing and where this generation is a little different is in the way that you're much more open about discussing self-care and yeah. you know issues around mental health and taking care of yourselves and that you're not just an athlete, you're an entire person. I don't know. If yeah. yeah, but here's, here's the difference. If we talked about the way the kids do today, we would have been in trouble. We would have been out. I'm so thrilled because it's so much better now that you can talk about what you think, what you feel, and everybody goes, oh, great, because we do know more and more about mental health, and it's so important. But in the, in the 70s, I couldn't talk about what was going through my head. Well, but, it, was always, uh, uh, it was always a weakness. You know, yeah. if you right. talked about how you were feeling or if you, you know, you were nervous or, I mean, that was always deemed as a weakness, but that's not the case anymore. Certainly in, uh, in the big sports, uh, even, I mean, any sports really, um, I think also you, you have to remember there's so much more money involved so that it's not just one person, it's a team. You have the support team, so there are people around you and it's okay to speak out, which is great. Yeah, um, you've got to it's challenge. It's actually yeah. a, a strength, it. not a weakness. It, it's it's the same thing when you know, Billie Jean um, was added in the early 80s, she lost every single endorsement overnight, maybe other than one. You know, nowadays, um, when you are your authentic self, you get endorsements. Um, right. So I think that's a much healthier it's, it's way, a huge to, you know, to, to live your life. So. I think it's important that people do keep speaking up. Yeah. How about over, over here? Yep. Oh, and we'll go. Did we answer? Did we help you at all? <laughs> 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 no, but I like to hear what you guys have to say. But I learned from all of you personally. So I want to say what an honor it is to to see both of you in person, and also thanks to Seton Hall for having this amazing event. Um, I'm a DNI director at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and also a very proud admin director of New Jersey's first LGBTQ specialized healthcare. Yes, really? RWJ is yeah. the first. Thank you. A ahead of the curve. Wow. Um, my question is: um, so, a little bit about our center. We started out with 100 patients our first year five years ago, and now we're up to 1,600 patients five years later. Um, 80% of our patients are of the transgender community. What are your thoughts about transgender, uh, com the transgender community and sports moving forward? I know that's a tough one. <laughs> no, no, I, no I, I'm always wrestling with this to make it, to make it right. I, Ilana and I, I think, would say that we err on inclusion. At least I do. I'll, I'll take responsibility. So the, the challenge is with the transgenders, especially for women, if the, if the testosterone's higher and all that. And I keep talking to different scientists and there's, there's all saying that's not the only measurement we should have and all this. So I don't know, but uh, we had the first transgender in 1977, I don't know if you know this, play on the WTA tour, the women's tennis pro tour, Dr. Renee Richards. Wow. And um, Ilana is the only person who played Renee first as a male in the Maccabee Games in Israel, and as a woman at the US Open, okay? Ilana's the only one, because Renee said, I bet you don't know the person. I said, well, actually, I do. <laughs> anyway, I, and actually, I said, it's Ilana, and she said, you're right. And she's our ophthalmologist, FYI. She's in her 80s, she doesn't operate anymore. She's a world-renowned ophthalmologist. But she played in 1977 and played on our tour, so one of the, the things that we talked about when we started, um, the nine of us, birth of women's, here are the three things. That any girl, if she's good enough, would have a place to compete, number one. Number two, to be appreciated for our accomplishments, not only our looks. And number three, to be able to make a living playing the 
sport, we had a passion to play, and that was tennis. So um, when we have, there were a lot of the women did not want her on the tour. I went to listen to her for four hours. I went to different doctors. I said, do you consider her a girl? And is there any, and, he, and every doctor said, yes, she's a woman. So I went back to the women. I said, we have to have her on the tour. It's the only right thing to do. And they go, no, no. I said, how about if we just do it for two weeks? Within one day, they're back and they come up to me. Oh, she's so great. She's so <laughs> nice. She's the greatest. Okay. So, but that was in 77. And I, we were the first ones to even get into that. So, and I, I had already re read Christine Jorgensen. I think she was the first transgender to have a book. But anyway, it's still out on what I don't have a finale, a final. I mean, do you have a, a, an opinion on that? I know where you're so I am an avid uh, sports fan, and I'm sorry, I'm a huge Rutgers football fan and basketball <laughs> fan. Rutgers? I know, what? I know. Um, <laughs> who, who was at the door? Who, who <laughs> right, let him in? We got one Rutgers guy. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's a difficult question because, um, you know, um, you're seeing a lot of things going on, and, and to your point, there's a lot of science in this, and whether you are on uh, gender um, hormone replacement therapy for long enough, do, does your bone density um, weaken? Does your muscle mass right. change? And, your and so, and your heart, and so all of those things are coming in, and how do you co continue to keep a, a, a competitive? Also, it's puberty is important. If and they puberty is important. Or not. So I mean, it's, a, a it's, a, to it's it. a tough question. Do you create a, an inclusive, a, a league that's inclusive of all? Do you separate? Do you keep it women, men's? I just want everybody to have a chance to play. That's, that's it. That's, that's yeah. my it. challenge. It's a tough right. question. And anyway, I, don't I, thought I don't know. I don't have the. Well, <laughs> let's move over to a Seton Hall fan, <laughs> if we could. <laughs> that's the <thing. laughs> Hopefully that's you, is it, yeah. Is this working? Okay. okay. Oh, now it's um, working. <laughs> hi, my name is Evando Thompson. I'm a Seton Hall alum. Go Pirates. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I thank you guys for being here. And thank you, Seton Hall, for putting this on, because I think uh, the moment we stop having these conversations, we lose. Um, so one thing I'm um, thinking about is something you said earlier. You said people just get used to whatever it is. We have to think, make people uncomfortable, um, not comfortable. and. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, like, you ha you're going to the Forbes 3050 Summit on March 7th, and you're going to be one of the speakers there. I'm just thinking about, is there a question that you're going to use to kind of push these business leaders to be thinking differently about how they address this issue of inclusion in all aspects? Um, um, I asked that specifically because I also work with Bloomberg Television. I'm one of the video editors there, and we had someone from an organization called Cocoa on which uses this business index that measures what these company CEOs are actually doing, not what they actually say. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anything that you're gonna specifically tell people? Is there a message that you're trying to send when you go to this 3050 Summit? Like, what, or do you have an intention of what you wanna do when you get there? The main thing I wanna do is listen to them. Uh, women's tennis actually was the first, I think, to go to, uh, to Qatar or Qatar, or whatever how you want to say it, uh, in in 2018, I think. 2008. Oh, it was eight, right? Yeah, you're right. It was 2008. We had a tournament there. Now we have three tournaments. I'm going to learn, but I'm all about inclusion, and it's we're the opposite. I mean, it's going to be. A, but I always think, okay, here's how I think. If I don't engage with other people, especially who don't look like me, who don't think like me then I'm never going to learn. i got to be stretched. And I think it's engagement of human beings is how we change things. I, I mean, I don't know. Do you, what do you think? I mean, I, I just want to bring up another statistic. So Coco, when they were on, they, they published their research, and they said that 50% uh, of women that work in the U.K. weren't staying in companies longer than two years. Whoa. Because, um, like, it's so easy to have the notion of, okay, you're accepted, you're in. And then once you're the token, we don't care about you. So... How do you sustain? Um, how do you sustain this progress? That that should be, in my opinion, the the conversation. Not how do we like start it? Because that's leadership starting, in yeah. that company. Every company, the leadership is responsible to make sure that everyone feels included, that they're seen, they're heard. It's really important. Every single human being matters. I don't care. 
who they are, they matter. And if you're a CEO, if you're a true leader, and if you're a great leader, there's a lot of emotion inside of you. Doesn't mean you show it all the time, but a caring and having empathy for others is absolutely important if you're gonna be a, a true great leader. So many leader, leaders are so narcissistic, they don't care about the people. But great leadership, that's the main thing. And that is horrible. When I, I can't wait now, the UK, two years. <laughs> What do they just feel like they don't belong, or what? Do they, why do they leave? Yeah, they just feel like they, they are, kind of, these companies reach their benchmarks. Like not to say that they have quotas that they have set in place that they need to reach numbers, but once they reach these numbers, they feel like they've done enough. Okay. And that's not enough. You have to, you know. No, no. So keeping D yeah. D E and I is, you know, diversity, inclusion, all that, equity. It's yeah. So important. It's just, it, it's just vital. It's got to be a part of you 24/7 if you're going to make your whatever culture you're in charge of to to do that and uh, oh man people are everything people if you don't have the right people you don't you're not going to make it anyway so and also you want people I mean I want people to really thrive you know it's like being on a team together mm -hmm. you know win yes. speaking of a team we have a Seton Hall tennis uh person right behind you Healy, do you want to answer do you want to yeah. ask next I'm I'm letting you skip the line no, yeah, go, go uh, sure. yeah. thank you <laughs> you're welcome thank you. Um, Thank you. So, as Jane said, I'm a part from the women's tennis team here in St. Falls. Um, and I'm also a manager for the women's basketball team here in the school. Yeah. Oh, this is good. So, yeah. my two favorite Thank sports. <laughs> so, as someone who's witnessing like two female sports here in the collegiate athlete, I wanted to ask you the way I witnessed is that the narrative sometimes feel towards women's sport is like, maybe like a charity in a way, because they're saying we need to support women, like we need to help women. And I don't think women, like, I don't hear towards men, we say we need to support men's sport. We're just going there, they're like pro athletes, it's just something that's happening. So my question to you both, Billy and Alana, is how can we change the narrative towards women's sports? How do you think? That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, that's that's a solid one. one. I don't it's know. the imponderable. No, I, I think I've said it already a lot of times. I think money matters. I think audience matters. I think getting people to watch you. Do you ever have any people watch you when you play matches? How many people do you think you have? 10, 20, 50, doing their homework and, or a friend or a family person? Is that kind of um, it? I mean is, your is your question fans? about college sports? Is it? Are, are you talking about or professional um, or what? Or just in general? In general, I would say, because for example, as again manager for the women's uh, basketball team here, I would say, did you go watch the game? Did you like this and that? And they're like, um, no, nah, not really. But I'm going to the men tomorrow, and the men is a bus ride, and the women's is literally here on campus. So they're just like not interested of even showing up and see what is going on. So I think it's the narrative that's in their mind of how women perform as athletes. Well, it's because we haven't done as well. I mean, once things get going, people don't talk to these women pro tennis players like that anymore. They used to. But that's why I wanted to change collegiate sports, you know, in our sport. So team, co-ed, revenue producing. Revenue producing talk. If you guys had a huge audience, if you had lots of money behind it, and everybody came to, then they wouldn't talk to you like that, would they? I They'd agree. be the opposite. They'd probably go, on, oh, God, did you see that one? Oh, my God, it was an amazing match against whatever. And that's what you want to make happen. But I think the players, the athletes, can do a lot themselves uh, that they don't really think about. Because they always think about what they want, but they don't think about how to improve the sport. I mean, we have, we're going to celebrate 50 years of equal prize money at the U.S. Open this year. Wow. 1973, we were the first major. In 72, with the media, I said, we're not coming back next year unless we get equal prize money. And they went, what? I, I, I do. Uh, no, but I, I think they need to understand this business aspect, and they have to go do a lot of it. Don't you think or not? Yes, but I do think it is changing. I think people are starting to um, invest in women and in women's sports. You see, I think what's, what's 
I've noticed it's different from, uh, you know, even the 90s and 2000s, right? In the, in the World Cups, like people would only support women's sports at the big events. Now you see them following teams and leagues, whether it's colleges or, or like even the NWSL, for even instance, uh, NWS or or, or WN, uh, WNBA teams. So I, I really do think um, that that's changing. That's changing. The other thing um, where I think uh, women's sports really needs a push is exposure and media exposure. So I, I think 40% of athletes are women, and I think we get four or five percent of media coverage. Yeah. Media and, is major. And if you don't know our stories and, and you don't have support programming around the events, nobody knows us. So I think that's really where we need the big push and the big investment. But I really do think it's coming. I know, um, you know, the NWSL is in rene renegotiation for a new um, media, media mm -hmm. package. I think they'll probably get 30 million or more. Uh, WNBA yeah. is around 25 million. Yeah. Women's tennis is at 500 million. Yeah, but, but we have a new contract coming up. But, but I do think That's that um, there is momentum. And the other thing that I think is, is a huge positive is now male athletes support women's teams. It's really cool, right? I mean, they do a lot more than they used to. I, I think men are know, much better now. It's it's cool to be a woman athlete, and the guys are fantastic about that. And I think, as Billy's always said, that you know we are in this together, and um, it's really important um, that we support each other. Also, find allies. If I didn't have male, if we hadn't had male allies in power positions helping women's tennis, we would have never made it. And, and there's a lot of men out there that absolutely care about us. Uh, so much, especially the ones that have daughters. They are, that does make a big difference. Any sponsorship I ever got or any of us got was because I swear they had daughters. I always ask every CEO, hi, how's your family doing? <laughs> and then I finally, if we find out they have girls, then you go hard. If they have all boys, <laughs> if they grew up with only brothers and only boys in their family, it is very, it, it's, just think about their experience. It's so. a short meeting. <laughs> Very short meeting, but do, and also, are you using social media a lot to invite people and really jacking it up? Yeah. You every, are every game day. We like repost uh, stories. Like there's a game today. Where is it? And things like that. Have you been telling your stories at all? Like I'd love to know your story. Every person on the team should tell their story in social media, because stories are what people don't care how, if you hit a good backhand or forehand. They care about you as a person. They like your story. And they want to hear your exposure. story. And exposure. It is exposure, you're right. And we have plenty of uh, members of student media here today, so yes. we've got a good story here, number one. But number two, we also have an incredible story on the women's basketball team with Lauren Park Lane, point yep, guard, I saw that. I saw Cindy that. Cooks. 39 and yeah. 99 assists. Yeah. They're yeah. doing great. So and, you know, maybe all of us could leave here and pick a game uh, to go see at Walsh uh, later on in the semester. Once you start watching anything, you'll get hooked because you'll get to know the story of the human beings involved, and that's everything. It's everything. I mean, LeBron James, you guys have a sense of who he is, right? You know his story, I promise, what he's, how he's helping. You know, he's the king and all that. No, I said, I'm the king. I told him, no, <laughs> king. But he, no, but, he, he, uh, but these guys that have exposure and people listen to them, but it's their story that makes them interesting as well. Not how many points they make. It's about who they are as a human being, just like each and every one of you. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just think you have to try to think, how can we promote in every way? Also, get, have you talked to the president of the school here? Have you talked to the AD a lot? Do you talk to these people or not really? I do not, but I just do want to point out that the story about Lauren Park Lane and also Shakina Robinson is on Shoe Athletic, uh, me and my teammate, Anna Flana, and another girl from the swim team, Meredith, we ran a series of interviews about them, and we will continue to do on uh, more Great. female athletes in awesome. the school here. Go! Yeah. Go, Pirates! Yeah. <laughs> so you're all welcome to watch. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a look at it. Thank how, you. How many of the people at Seton Hall know how you got the name Pirates? Does anybody know? Does it? You do. <laughs> Michael knows. Michael knows. <laughs> anybody else? You guys go to this school? Do you know why you're called pirates? Or where it happened? Or how it happened? That's history. Yes. Because one of the first things I looked up. 
but I'm not going to tell you because you don't know. <laughs> it has to do with a baseball game. 1930, I think. Is that right? That's right. You're my boss. Yeah. Knowing history. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more. Thank you so much for being the last question. I'm a director of diversity and inclusion as well, so thank you for bringing that up before at Cooperman Barnabas up the road in Livingston. Um, when we think about race equity, it's not just for February. Uh, gender equity is not just March for Women's History Month. LGBTQ rights are not just June for Pride. How, what's your advice on encouraging people to show up with those intersections of identity every day, not just when mass media or uh, other folks are celebrating them, but to truly live their truth um, and show up as you are every day, even in the face of adversity. Well, do you find they do? I think uh, in so many ways people are feel proud when they're being celebrated, and then the narrative moves on and it's time to celebrate someone else. How do we encourage people to show up every day? Um, what's your advice? I think you've already told us, we should show up every day, being our authentic <laughs> right. self. No, and sometimes that's not easy. It wasn't easy for me. I really had a hard time. I so. think, um, again, it also comes from leadership that sets the culture that's of a company, a school, a team. Um, but I think to be able to be your authentic self actually makes the team, the company stronger. Um, there's no question um, that all of a lot of our great ideas have come from people who aren't like us. It's kind of boring to talk to the same people um, who think alike, look alike. And so I always give um, laugh at Billie Jean because she'll get in a, a taxi or she'll go to the deli or it doesn't matter where she goes, she's always asking questions. And I think probably one of the most important things, you've taught me a lot of things, but well, you've taught me a lot. No, no, no. <laughs> you teach each no, other. You know, but, but one of them is, um, you know, if somebody's bored, if you're bored by someone, it's because you're not asking the right question. And I think, um, again, it's the culture that gets set within the organization. But um, I think we're, we're all a lot more alike than we are different if we just listen and are open. Yeah. That's a great answer. And now, and now we'd like to welcome up members of uh, our athletic community and students who yes. play sports here on campus, including All the right. tennis team. I we'll have a little something for you. Thank you. This is great. Thanks a lot. What's your name? I'm Danny. Danny. Hey, Danny. Ilana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, wow. Cool. What's your name? Huey. Huey? Nice to meet you. Take oh, a look. Thank you. How cool is that? Oh, thank you. Okay. 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 Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I don't know. Have to suck in. I don't know if it'll fit. And we have, a, <laughs> we have a photo. Uh, Can we get everybody lined up? Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. Put it over that way. I was trying to find you. Hi. Are you tennis Oh, that's great. Really? Wow. How many do we have on the team? Eight. Yeah, eight scholarships. Short ones in front, tall ones in the back. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I think it's the Oh, wait a minute. Here, i got to put this back here. Here. We're ending with a photo op. Yep. It's an appropriate way to go out. Do you want our names to bend? Back? Yeah. Can I bend? Yeah, I can bend a little. <laughs> <laughs> Low forehand volley. Not me. But I've got the Jewish <laughs> thing. You got the Jewish thing? <laughs> the Jewish bend from the way. Thanks. <laughs> oh, wait, what are we doing? We can, we can do whatever. Also, thanks to uh, everyone from the office <laughs> again today. Yeah, <laughs> like Marjorie. Sophia, Nancy, everyone. Great. Thank and, you guys so much. I, I have to, um, <laughs> thanks, Jane. Look. And thank you, Billy and oh, Alana, for wait being here today. Yeah, no, one more thing. Um, oh. we, I met Jane. Um, I was a player, and she, I think, was working in Westchester. Um, mm -hmm. For the journal? Yeah, the journal news. Correctly. Alana, come on. And, she's, um, on <laughs> she's on it, baby. Uh. And it's it's wonderful to be here, and you've had an amazing career. And yeah. um, relationships are everything. That's what Billy says. She talks about the people that you meet along the way. And um, Jane was covering women's sports before it was popular. So you're all very fortunate to have her here. So it's honestly a privilege for us to be here.
Thank you. Thank you very much. That's why we're here. We came for Jane. Wow. Okay. No, we did. Thank you. That's so appreciate her. Well, thank, thank you. you for your leadership. Oh, thank you, Billy. Well, well gosh, I, I didn't pay them to say that. <laughs> but thank you all so much for coming. I, you know, I want to put on and I want this to be a community event that are meaningful and impactful for our community. And I think there's no better person to get that going here than today with you here, Billy. Well, thank, I, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you guys. What, okay, where did I, I leave off? I didn't meet you, right? Did I meet you? Where are you from? No, I know what your name is. Alicia.